Some of you might remember me. My name is Pontima Smythe. And I just need to air myself because I'm fucked off. It's spring. Happy Ostara. What a wonderful, bloody time of year. It's my favourite time of year. And it's a beautiful day. It's really misty, so there's hardly, you can't see the horizon very well. Um, but it's stunningly beautiful. It's warm. I'm going to go for a swim. It's high tide. You can't see, but the moon is waxing gibbous in the background up there, and it's just looking gorgeous. I love a waxing gibbous moon uh, because... Um, I'm waning as well. I like a gibbous moon because you can really see the shape of the planet, I think, when it's gibbous. Um, you know, when it's full or a crescent, it looks a bit more 2D. But when it's gibbous, it's got that kind of like, I don't know, it looks really Star Wars, I think. Um, so I just had an incredible few days with um, Jonathan Kay and the Fools. We did the Eternal Great Beginning, which was a five-day immersion. And it was just fantastic um so archetypal uh, we did it for the spring equinox and we um had five full facilitators one of which I, I was one of which and we just made an offer to the 40 participants and said who we were what we did um what we were offering and people picked us it was a bit nerve-wracking because there's always that thing about i don't know a sports day or sports when you get picked or don't get picked I never got picked because I'm really shit at sports um, but three people picked me which was a nice size and we did a lovely um, session so I worked with what I know so I mean that's what you were asked to do and, and the reason why it's called an eternal great beginning is I've been doing fooling for 20 years but you're always starting from the beginning like there's slight changes over the years like, I'm more relaxed about the fact that I'm shit. <laughs> like, and it's not that I'm shit. It's just, you're always working with the same blocks, you know? We've all got an ego, and we all have the thing that trips us up, the thing that makes us go into our heads um, and not be fully present and be judging ourselves or feeling, you know, like we've got to put on an act, and we go into kind of... It's really exhausting when you're in that place because you have to really work hard to just put on this act be yourself like when you're not really being yourself um and we all have it we all do it but there are things that trigger us and fooling is all about triggering it because it's about being more and more aware of it and the more aware of it you are it doesn't go away um it might relax a little bit but more than anything you just forgive yourself for it more than anything that's like over 20 years that's what i've got from it i've slowed down a little bit I'm a little bit more present. I'm a little bit more in the room. But more than anything, I am more relaxed about when it happens, when I trigger. I'm like, okay, I'm triggered. This is what's happening. But I'm going to just work through it. And I worked with my group on archetypes. And I used ceremony and did um, worked with the moon phases. So we did a um, mojo bag, dark moon, as a beginning. And then we did the waxing moon, youthful, young, innocent virgin feel. Um, <laughs> my virgin was actually a horrible man called Pontimus Smythe. So something that we do in the foolings, we have, um, as well as your archetypes, you also have a repertory company. Now, a repertory company is um, like a, a set of characters. You know when you meet someone who's really funny and they've got and they can just sort of slip into these characters... Um, they just become these other people and they'll do accents or whatever. It's learning to do that, basically. Like, what are the characters that are in you? And it's useful, once again, to know what your archetype is to do that. Because by knowing your archetype, you kind of know... It's a bit like a, you know your grain. So you learn what's the direction of your grain, like a piece of wood. Um, what your wood looks like, which wood you are. And then it's interesting to then go against the grain. So my character, you know, my archetype is Venus. It's the goddess of sex and fertility. And, Af you know, it's Aphrodite. And it's very feminine. So my brilliant opposite to that, I just will never get bored of this. I love it so fucking much. <laughs> I love this island so much. Um, so my, I went to the, the waxing um, crescent moon phase, the virgin phase, 
as a really horrible, slimy, rich, misogynist dickhead called Pontimus Smythe. And he's my virgin. And he came because he heard there was going to be virgins. But he's a virgin because he fucking, no one wants to go near him. Um, so that was fun and funny. And it's really fun to play the opposite to your archetype because um, it's going against the grain. And that just, it just feels so much more free. Like I could do Pontimus Smythe all day long. Um, and I did a video which I put up on Facebook because I'd got really triggered by some comments a couple of guys had made about, you know, what had been happening in the news, social media with Sarah being murdered and just like, oh God, fed up of like men getting slagged off. Um, you know, it's not all men and all this. And I just, I just got really triggered. But rather than like arguing with them in the pub, I put a video up of Pontimus Smythe just agreeing with them and being a complete fucking dickhead. And I think that had a much better effect and made more of a point than if I'd actually had an argument with them in the pub when we were drunk. So that feels really satisfying, you know, and it just gives you this like ability to really be free and play. Because in all of us, and this I think is really important, there's an, a misogynist in all of us. There's a racist in all of us. There's a bigot in all of us. Um, we might choose that's not the bit of us that we want to be. You know, that's not, it's not who we are. But, but we all have, our brain goes there sometimes. You know, whether you like it or not, your brain will go there and it will think of the thing that's awful. And then you go, I don't want to be that. And you repress it. And we all do it. Um, but to actually give it voice, but you're not saying it's you, you're doing it mocking. But it feels so liberating because your body and your brain is like, oh, right, I'm allowed to, I'm allowed to say these things. But it doesn't mean that I'm ruled by it and that it makes me that person. That person's in me, but it's, it's in me to express with, which does two things. One, demonstrate how awful the things are that they say by saying it in a mocking way. You know, we do it. I was being Pontimus Smythe, ironically. Um, and by doing that, voiced all these awful things um, that might have popped up in my brain that I didn't believe or think. But it meant that I got to just say them. And it meant that they were liberated and freed, which just felt really freeing. It feels really exciting and fun to be able to just do it. But I'm saying the opposite. I'm saying I don't agree with this. Um, but also, there's an element of empathy by walking in someone else's shoes as well, you know? Like, what is going on with Pontimus Smythe? Like, he was probably abused at boarding school. You know, he's probably raped. He's probably a closet gay. He's being the way he's being because, actually, he's really confused. He really wanted to be an artist. He didn't want to go into the military. You know, and it's just like, I mean, this is all made up. It's just... But by being my character, being him, there's an element of, yeah, stepping into someone else's shoes and, and the, the empathy that comes with that. So, you know, um, it's really a powerful thing to do. So I've got a few characters. I've got Pontimus Smythe, this horrible, big, virgin, asshole, rich guy. Then there's uh, Venus, my Aphrodite character. Um, she's French, obviously, and she's very sexy and sexual. Then I discovered some new ones this week, which was fun. Um, I discovered Annie the Anarchist, who's a pirate. Um, and she can speak in Tudor or she can just be really like um, Essexy, really, and bolshy. Um, and that was fun. She was fun to be. She was very liberated and rah. Um, and it's a part of me that I... It's the bit that I feel like I've had to be the most apologetic for and repress the most because I always feel like as a woman... It's not okay for you to be a warrior. I've got like one sticky up bit of hair that I can just see in my shadow that's annoying me. Um, yeah, to be a strong, powerful warrior woman feels like that's always been something that I've had to apologise for in my life. So, um, yeah, um, it's nice to kind of liberate her. And then I hadn't quite found her properly yet, but I also have uh, an old woman. Um, and this, again, you have the Virgin Mother and Crone. I think there's a little girl that I, I should find at some point as well. Um, so I have the little girl, the mother, which is kind of, I don't really do mother, but mother is um, Venus, like sexual woman, and then the crone. So yeah, they're fun things to play with. And by doing that, so when I say that, it covers my archetype. So I have Venus, Aphrodite, the, the fertility sex goddess, is covered by playing her, playing Venus. Um, but also then being the opposite, as Pontimus Smythe. Then I have um, Ing, this masculine warrior archetype as well. Um, the Godding, 
and he shows up as uh, the pirate. And then I have the Virgin Mother and Crane is another of my archetype types. And um, that, that, yeah, so then I play the Virgin Mother and Crane, that's kind of in Venus, and then this old lady. And like I say, I should sort of find a child. So it's just another way to work with your archetypes that you can, because you, you know, you have, um, in Fooling, you have play, a play, the play. So you have Venus, a Venus, the Venus. So you have Venus, which is the planet and the whole uh, atmosphere of everything and, you know, just the word. We know what Venus is. And then you have a Venus, which is me on Earth being Venus. And then you have the Venus, which is the archetype of Venus. Look at all the cows listening to me. They're like, what is she going on about? What's she going on about, eh? Ooh, what is she talking about? She's just rabbiting on, holding this weird box thing in the air. Hello, hello. I don't want you to come close and then get electrocuted, but it's nice to see you. Yes, very nice. I got really scared of cows on my pilgrimage, and um, I did get chased by a herd, but then I found out that actually they're just really inquisitive, aren't you? Hello, you're just really inquisitive, aren't you? Hello, yes you are. They are, they're very nosy. And when I realised that, they stopped being so scary. Yes. Hello. Boogie, boogie, boo. Boogie, boogie, boo. So, yeah. Yeah, it's a different way to work with them. Um, yes, yeah, so you've got... So, so then again, you have... Um, yeah, so you have a... You have a warrior. Then you have a warrior, which is me on Earth as a warrior. And then you have the warrior, which is the archetype of the warrior. So by playing the repertory company, you're playing another one of the uh, warriors. You know, so my pirate, Annie, is another a uh, warrior. Um, and it just, it's an interesting thing to do because it makes you realise how you are one of many of the, the warrior. You know, so I'm a warrior, Annie's a warrior. I'm playing both of them. It means that Jolie's no more real, really, than Annie. And it puts things in perspective in that sense, that we're all just playing a thing of the thing in thing. So you have world, world, a world. This is a world, maybe, amongst many in the universe. And then you have the world, which is the archetype of the world, of this world. So, um, yeah, it's, it's good to explore this repertory company. And that might be a step too far for you if you're not a performer. That might seem a bit like, oh yeah, it's not something I'm going to do. But for those of you who do have that kind of thing bubbling away in you, you maybe do play characters or have accents and things, to start to think about how they fit into your archetypes and how they are different uh, thingies of whatever your archetype is. And that, that means that your character that you play is as well. But it's just, there's quite a, there's a lot of freedom in it. And there was a thing in the Tudor times where um, they didn't trust actors. There's a, and I think there's been generally throughout history a feeling of not trusting actors. And there's a story from the Tudor times that is kind of explains it. And it's a bit to do with this. Uh, the devil's trying to tempt mankind. Um, he gets him drunk. He throws women at him. He's like giving him riches. He's trying to get him fat on feed. And every time mankind clocks what the devil's doing and he says, nay, you will not take my soul master. I will resist thee for my heart is true and I am a child of God. And the devil after a while is like, oh, do you know what? Okay, all right, I give up. I give up. I give up. You're right. It's fine. I'm not, I won't go for your soul anymore. But you know what? The earth is just you and me on it. There's no Eve right now. Uh, it's very boring. So why don't we, just to entertain ourselves, let's put on a play. Uh, and Adam can see no harm in that. It's not written as a sin to be in a play. So he performs in a play with the devil and has a great time, plays many parts. And at the end of the play, the devil, he starts to laugh. And mankind says, what? Why are you laughing? And he said, oh, it was hard to take your soul before because you believed that your soul was yours and it was yours alone. But now you have worn many souls. And so now it will be easy for me to take yours because you are less connected to it. Now that might sound... Oh, you know, ooh, well, I don't want to do that. But actually, you know, if you're not, if you're not uh, of the faith, um, looking at it from a psychological point of view, we're really attached to the idea that we really are the person we are. We really are. And that's just ego. And it's not true. Like, your twin, your inner world is everything you're not. 
and that's still you. You've got your inner and your outer, and your outer is everything you've groomed and dressed as being this person, this ego. And then everything else, your inner, is everything else. Everything else. This, this beach, this universe, your mother, the, the aliens, the, the angels, everything. Everything else is your twin, it's your inner world. And it's you, because we're all one and we're all infinite, and this is all one thing, the outer and the inner. There's only one infinity and we're all in it. It's the, we've got, we're all in the same one. So the inner and outer is one thing and we're all connected and it's all one. Um, and yeah, your, your twin is everything other than what your ego is. And so the more you wear bits of the other, the bits of the twin, the more you spend time as your twin and not as you, just the more um, freedom and flexibility and like possibility there is because you can then be anything. Yeah, you get to be everything. You don't have to be this fixed thing that you're so desperately trying to prove exists. Because, yeah, it does exist, but so does everything else. And you're all of the things. You're all of them. So, um, yeah, the more you uh, play with that, the more free you are to express yourself and be creative and not just be this rigid story that you've been telling yourself your whole life. <clears throat> so there you go. So that's Repertory Company, which feels like it's... Uh, something that's come from this five days where I realised that working with archetype, it, yeah, it can be broken down into many parts um, and this is another way to explore it. So happy spring, happy equinox, this is wonderful. Um, I'm in love by the way, which is really nice. I've fallen in love with a beautiful man um, who is absolutely, he adores me and is kind and lovely and none of the shadow weird stuff and that's really lovely so that's all very springtimey feeling and um yeah it's beautiful to be here so happy spring love you all take care bye bye i'm fucked off because i'm sick of all of this negativity towards men that you're hearing in social media at the moment i mean what is it something like 97 percent of men are rapists i mean well 97 percent of women have been raped or sexually abused. I, I think, I, maybe I'm exaggerating that statistic, but it's something ridiculous like that. I mean, the thing is, if 97% of women have been sexually abused or raped, that does mean that 97% of men have to have been sexual abusers or rapists. And I, for one, am not. And no one of the men I know are. So either this is, is all fucking lies, or what, there's just one man very busy? <laughs> Wouldn't mind being him. <laughs>